God, with our voices, we cry out to you, to the Lord, to the Savior of all. And with our voice, we plead for mercy that you would not give us according to our sin. But Lord, we pour out our hearts and our troubles before you, knowing that you hear and you know the pain and the cries of our hearts. And Lord, we do declare that you are our refuge. And Lord, we run to you today as a nation, as a church. We run to the only shelter that can not only shade us from the storm, we run to the only shelter that can bring healing for our souls. And so we run to Jesus, the rock of our salvation today. And we pray that this nation as well would run to the rock and find its hope its strength, its salvation in you. God, we submit our hearts to you now. Ask for your spirit to prepare our hearts to hear from you. We also ask that you would cleanse us of our sins. Renew us again with the joy of salvation to be strong within our hearts. God, I ask that you would fill me, anoint me, empower me with your spirit. And Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me today the life-giving words that would bring glory to Jesus. Father, I ask that you would strengthen me now for this task at hand, the sacred task of bringing your word before your people. So at this time, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. And it is in that precious name we pray. Amen. Now, we are a nation in mourning, as hope has now turned into despair concerning the Sewol ferry disaster. Of the 476 passengers and crew on board, 339 were students, were children, were teachers from a high school on a field trip to Jejido. Only 174 people were rescued, and all on that first day of its sinking. And the remainder are presumed to have drowned. With the death toll nearing almost 200 now, there are still over 100 missing. One newspaper reported that many of the students' bodies who were most recently discovered the past few days had broken fingers most likely revealing the panic and desperate attempts that they had of trying to survive, of trying to break through windows or doors or walls, or the desperation of trying to keep their bodies above water in the final moments. Reuters reported reported also finding one boy and one girl who tied their life jackets together, probably because they did not want to float away alone. We can't even imagine the horror of their final moments when they realized that they were not going to make it. We can't imagine the pain, the grief, the sorrow, the suffering that parents and family members are going through right now during this extreme time of sorrow. But all of us have been affected by it. As a people in this nation in this hour, we have been affected by the heartbreak that the news reports bring each day. And so we are a nation in mourning. So where do we turn? What can we do? We turn to the same place that David turned to when he wrote this psalm that we'll be looking at today. A place of hiding while he is in a cave is also a place where he found the Lord. We turn to the God of all comforts for strength during this time of uncertainty. 
So turn with me to Psalm chapter 142 uh, as we seek comfort for a nation in need in this hour. Psalm chapter 142. And we turn to the God of all comfort. And the reason we turn to the Lord in this hour and the reason we turn to the Lord in our days of pain is because through this psalm and through this prayer of David, we learn several things about this God of all comforts. And the first thing that we learn is that God knows. So everyone repeat, God knows. And that is important for us to learn during our days of pain. And this psalm is referred to as a mystical of David when he was in a cave, a prayer. This was a prayer of David while he was running for his life from Saul. And he writes it in a cave of all places. Things in David's life did not quite turn out the way that he expected. He was anointed from a young age before his older brothers and before his father to be the next king who would rule Israel. But now he is running. He is tired. He is homeless. And he is in a cave. And what does David do? He prays. And let's look at that prayer. Verses 1 and following. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Why does David cry out to God in his days of suffering and pain? He pleads for mercy from God. God, do not give me according to my sins. Why does David turn to the Lord in this time of desperation? It is because he knows that God knows what he is going through. Verse 3 says, you know my way. And it is a comfort and a reminder that God knows what you are going through, that you are not alone in your pain. You know, one of the loneliest feelings in the world is when you are suffering and you feel like no one knows what you are going through. Grieving the loss of someone you love after years have gone by, when everyone else has forgotten, everybody else has moved on, but you still hurt especially on key dates, birthdays, memorial dates, holidays. It is a lonely and silent kind of suffering that you go through, which is why I still pray for certain loved ones that I know who are still grieving during key moments, why I still pray for Pastor Ha's wife and children. You feel alone, but God knows. This nation is in a time of mourning over the disaster that happened on the ferry last week, and our hearts break for the hundreds of people who lost their children, who lost their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, their sons and daughters. And adding to that heartbreak of loss was reading some of the stories behind the parents and how the parents wanted their children to go on this field trip. One parent told of how her daughter did not want to go on this field trip to Jeju because she already went. And she kept insisting to her mom, Mom, I don't want to go. I already went recently. Please, let me just stay home during those days. But her mom didn't want her daughter to feel left out. When all of her classmates would return from the trip, Her mom didn't want her daughter to feel left out when they hear the stories of all the fun that they had together. And so she forced her daughter to go on this trip. And now she is gone. And her mother keeps rehearsing over and over again the conversations that she had with her daughter, convincing her to go. How she wishes so much she would have listened to her daughter. That is a pain few of us can understand. Also, news reports revealed that many parents worked overtime 
or extra hours, and some parents even got an extra job to work late at night to accumulate enough money to send their children on this field trip. Because you need to understand that where we are going to do this prayer walk on Saturday, this Ansan area, it is not an affluent area. It is not known for the wealthy dwelling in that area. In fact, it is a very blue-collar area of Korea where a lot of these families struggle to make ends meet. But these families, because they did struggle financially, and this field trip was a huge expense that they normally would not be able to afford out of love for their children, knowing that for some of them, this would be a once-in-a-lifetime field trip. And so they worked extra hours. And some even went into debt in order to pay for their child's trip. With tears, one mother told a reporter of how hard it was to work that extra job late at night just so her daughter could go. That is a pain few of us can understand. You know, suffering has a way of slowing down time, doesn't it? Each minute that goes by seems so much longer. But whether it's losing a loved one, losing a job, losing a relationship, or whether it is the loss of finances, few things make us feel so alone like suffering, failure, and loss. Grief, especially, is a very small circle. What adds to the loneliness is the fact that for many people in an Asian context, especially in this country, we cover up our flaws, our failures, our mistakes, our weaknesses. Why? Because image is such a big deal in this culture. We have to show people our best face, our best outfits, Why? Because we know that people love conditionally. If they really knew what I was really like, maybe they won't like me. If they really knew what I did, I don't think they would be able to look at me the same. And so we cover up our failures. We cover up our pain. We hide our tears because we know that we too love people conditionally. We know that others do. We know that we do. And so we think God does as well. We think, I can't let anyone know. What will they think? What will they say? Will they still like me? Does God still like me? That is a pain that few people can understand. But the good news that we see in this passage today is that God knows. And God loves you the same. God knows where you have been. God knows what you are going through. God even knows the pain of losing a child. He knows the pain of seeing his son die on the cross. That is why verse 3 is good news. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. You may feel lonely, but you are never alone. God is there. And Jesus promised, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, declares the Lord. You may feel alone, but that is not truth. God is always with you. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He knows what's burdening your heart today. He knows everything in your mind, in your heart, in your life. And you know what? He still loves you. Amen? That is good news. So you can tell God anything. You can tell God everything because He knows. And that is good news for the people of God. But not only does God know, but also God cares. So everyone repeat, God cares. 
You see, it's one thing to know something about another person, but it's another thing to care. Verse 4 of Psalm 142. Look to the right and see, there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. There's nothing like pain to take us on the road of self-pity. Like David, we often feel like no one notices, no one cares. You know, I know someone who did elderly ministry in the U.S., and in one nursing home, a lady named Sue was 74 years old and getting ready to go on her first date in over 30 years with a guy named Mike who was 82 years old. It was going to be her first date in over 30 years. And a volunteer at that elderly nursing home asked her, she was also celebrating the excitement with her in giddiness and says, what are you going to wear? And right when Sue heard that question, she broke down and started to cry. And when the volunteer asked, what's wrong? I'm so sorry. Sue responded by saying, no one had asked her about her clothes in more than 30 years. And she said, it seemed like no one cared about who I was or what I wore anymore. And so that question became a ministry of grace into Sue's life because it was saying, I care even about what you wear. And that's one of the reasons why we have an elderly ministry as well because unfortunately the elderly population in Korea is not only growing at a great rate, it is one of the highest age groups of suicides in Korea as well. Because unfortunately, even their own family members, even their own children and grandchildren no longer visit them, no longer call them, no longer care. And so we have this ministry to be a small representation of God's heart for them. The ministry of presence, to be there with them, to be there for them, and to simply say, I care. That is gospel. That is God to you. God is saying, I know everything that you've been through. I know every pain of your heart. I know every pain of rejection that your heart has experienced. And I not only know, I care. I care that you hurt. I care that you grieve. I care that you suffer. Because if you ever felt like no one cares and we all go through that, it is a lie. And that is why we need faith in God's word, not in our feelings to govern how we live. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him. Why? Because He cares for you. Why does He say we are to cast all our anxieties upon the Lord? Peter says it is because He cares for you. He says, give to him, talk to him, cast all of your worries, all of your anxieties, everything that you care about, everything that worries you, everything that bothers you, give it to the Lord. Because everything that you care about, God cares about. Amen? And it takes faith to believe that. And it is a fight of faith to believe that. There is nothing too small or too insignificant that if it concerns your heart, it matters to the heart of God. For example, I know this to be true because I am a fallen, selfish human being. But when my son Enoch is bothered by a slight thing that's sticking out of his toe and he is staring at his foot and toe and trying to bite it off, I care about it because he cares about it. A small hangnail. 
It matters to me because it matters to him. That is the heart of a father. If it matters to you, it matters to the heart of God. Why? Because you matter to God. Nothing is too small that you cannot discuss it with the Lord. He cares about what you wear. He cares about what you'll eat. He cares about your marital status. He cares about your singleness. He cares about your struggles. He cares, but he also says, do not worry about them. Because I know that you care. I know that you need them. He says, I'm going to take care of you. Trust me. Give them to me. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I like how the message translation says 1 Peter 5. Eugene Peterson translates it like this. Live carefree before God because he is most careful with you. Live carefree knowing that you are in the hands of a good and loving God. He will care for you. So God knows what you are going through. That is good news. That somebody knows. And what's even better news is he, he not only knows, he cares about what you are going through. And how do we know he cares? Because another thing that this word tells us is that he not only cares, God hears. So everyone repeat, God hears. He hears your voice. He hears the cry of your heart. He hears the tears that drop. Psalm 142, verses 5 and 6. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry. Other translation says, listen to my cry. Take heed to my cry. Listen to me, God, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. This is too hard for me. My enemies outnumber me. They are too strong for me. God hears the cries of his children always. David says, I cry to you, my refuge, my portion. God hears the cry of your heart. You know, I'm a deep sleeper, and my wife usually complains about that. <laughs> but she's always fascinated that the moment my son cries at night, in an instant, I shoot up. Because my heart, my heart's concern is for him. And if me, as a fallen, selfish sinner, awakens to the simple cry of my son. There is a perfect, loving God, our Father in heaven, who will never miss a cry of your heart. He hears, and that is good news too. He says, deliver me, save me because of my enemies. They are too strong for me. God, I cannot handle it by myself. The prayers that God loves to hear are honest prayers of desperation and dependence upon him. Our enemies are too strong for me, God. That is why I need you. Because though my enemies are too strong for me, they are not too strong for you. Enemies are strong, but God, you are stronger. My sin is strong. But God, you are stronger. My shame was great. But Jesus, you are greater. That is our God. 
stronger than sin, greater than shame, more powerful than any pain. That is our God, and that is why He is our refuge. He is the one we run to. That cry of desperation brings great exaltation to Christ and His sufficiency. Because the kinds of prayers that God honors, God hears, God answers, are prayers that declare our helplessness in ourselves and our hope in God. That is why God honors fasting. That is why God honors prayer. God honors all things and all disciplines and all expressions of a heart that says, by myself, I am hopeless. Therefore, I fast, I pray, because my hope is in you. And every time we declare our weakness in ourselves, needing to bank on the goodness, the grace, the mercies of God, God comes forth in power because those are the hearts, the prayers, the fasting that God honors. Because those are the prayers, the fasting, the heart that honors God. We turn to the Lord for strength. We turn to the Lord for shelter. Because He is our hope. God hears the cries of His children, Exodus 3, 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering." So much gospel in that one verse as God's people are oppressed by Pharaoh and the enemies. What does God say? I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard the cries because of their slave drivers and I've seen and I know their suffering. That is our God. You know, right after the uh, morning service at Dogok, um, during the ministry fair, there is a little boy, about three or four years old. He was playing with some of the praise team members, and then he hit his mouth on the edge of a table. Boom! And you, everybody could hear it. And then the next thing you hear is, ah! You know he's in pain. Now what's interesting is that he didn't say, Papa, I hit my teeth on the table, it hurts right now. He doesn't explain. <laughs> or he doesn't say, Papa, those two girls, they don't know how to babysit, get them out of here. They didn't say, he didn't say that either. All he said was, Papa, Daddy. That's all he said. And that's all he needed to say. Because then his father came, he held him, he comforted him. Because one of the most painful things for a parent is when your child is hurting and cries out your name. Not explaining why, because they simply want you. Because when the child has the embrace of the father, that child has comfort and that child begins to experience healing. And that's the kind of prayer that God our Father loves to hear as well. Because sometimes the best prayer to pray is simply, Abba, Father, Daddy, help. Hold me. And there are seasons where sometimes the best prayer to pray is simply a sigh because you just can't say anything. And God understands. God can hear even the smallest sighs. 
God can hear because God is near. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord draws near closely in a special way to the brokenhearted. What we learn throughout Scripture also concerning prayer is God draws near in a special way because God is omnipresent, God is everywhere, but when His people truly pray, the presence of God draws near that person and that place of prayer in a special way. And what Psalm 34 also reveals is where there are broken hearts that turn to Him, His presence always draws near in a special way. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And that is good news too. Is your heart hurting? Is your heart breaking? Know that he is especially close to you today. God's presence is very close to this nation right now as it mourns. He hears the cries of this nation. And he hears the tears that fall. But our God is not just one who hears their cries. He cries with us. He rejoices with those who rejoice. He weeps with those who weep. Why? Because he is a God of compassion. And compassion means to suffer with. That is our God. He knows. He cares. He hears. But also what we learn in our passage today is that God restores. So everyone repeat, God restores. God heals and restores hearts that hope in him. Psalm 142 verse 7 says, Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. God sets people free from prisons. Now notice, David is in a cave. He's not in jail. But because he is in a season of suffering, and we all know when we are in a season of suffering, it also feels like a prison. And so he says in verse 7, Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. God sets people free from prisons, and the greatest prison of all was the prison of sin that we have been set free from that once enslaved us. And the response after being set free is to give thanks to his name. Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me for you will deal bountifully with me. And by faith, David knows that God will deal well with him. He knows that God will surround him with favor and restore his life again. Psalm 71, verse 20 and 21 in your outline says, Though you have made me see troubles many and bitter. Now notice, who is the cause of the trouble? He is saying, though you, God, have allowed me to see troubles, many and bitter. You, God, will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once again. This is the same faith that we see in Job that acknowledged the sovereignty of God even in his suffering. You have made me see troubles. Many bitter. God, you have allowed this into my life. But I trust you, God, that you will also restore my life again. You see, the cross transforms pain, suffering, in order to give it a new purpose. The cross transforms our past, bringing forgiveness, restoration. And the cross transforms our future by giving hope for our tomorrow. Because God is greater than the mistakes of our past. He is greater 
than the challenges that we face in our present. And he is greater than any challenges or fears that we would have for our future. He is greater, he is stronger, and only he can restore. You see, our God is in the business of restoration. And he will one day make all things new. He's not starting over and making everything from scratch. He's not making all new things. He is taking what he has made, restoring them, and making them new again. Job, Job Joel 2.25 I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, my great army, which I sent among you. Again, the sovereignty of God, even through our suffering. God can restore years and decades that were lost. Eugene Peter once said this, suffering is not evidence of God's absence, but of God's presence. And, is, and it is in our experience of being broken that God does his surest and most characteristic salvation work. There is a place to, there is a way to accept, embrace, and deal with suffering that results in a better life, not a worse one. And more of the experience of God, not less. God is working out his salvation in our lives the way that he has always worked it out. At the place of brokenness, at the place of the cross of Jesus, and at the very place where we take up our cross, learning to die and follow him. My friend Eugene Cho said this recently, don't mistake God's patience with his absence. His timing is perfect and his presence is constant. And I think that is a great reminder for us. In faith, do not confuse God's patience his timing that is different from ours. Don't think that is his absence. He is always with you. 